morning. Welcome to episode 90 of the Bumper Sticker Faith Podcast. My name is Sam Key, and I'm looking all around my studio for my co-host, and uh, he's not here. So uh, it, you, you just have to put up uh, with me today, but luckily, we are blessed to have a special guest, someone that I've known of for a couple of years now, kind of, I guess, creepily, <laughs> but... but um. <laughs> Uh, I I followed a podcast that uh, his church and ministry put out um, called Celebrate Recovery, and his name is Scott Stubert. And it's Scott, actually Stubert. Stubert. Okay. Stubert, but that's okay. I get called Stubert all the time. It's no big deal. I've probably heard that. Yeah, on the uh, maybe even on the podcast itself. But Scott Stubert, welcome to episode ninety. Yeah, man. Where are you at? California? I'm in Modesto, California, Central Valley, man. So the wine and everything is uh, made. Yeah, I have a family in Fiddletown, California, which is east of you (laughs) somewhere, somewhere, a small little town. uh, And they're uh, supporters of uh, Bumper Sticker Faith podcast. (laughs) So, um, yeah. So welcome to the show. And I was excited to have a conversation with you uh, because I want to expose more people, not just in the church, but yes, in the church, but more people to what you're doing and to the ministry of Celebrate Recovery because Celebrate Recovery is bigger than you. It's a a nationwide thing, uh, maybe even more than that. I don't know. But you happen to... um, to lead at, at the church you're at big valley grace community church correct it's yeah the fairly large celebrate recovery ministry right correct yeah so we've got about uh last night we had uh we met and we had about uh 290 adults there and that's wow. not including teenagers and kids that are showing up for yeah. their own recovery stuff yeah and i've i've been in i've not gone through a, a whole program or all the steps, but I've uh, attended groups here and there. And, and it's like maybe five to 10 people, which is great. That's fantastic. That's still really good. Yeah. Um, but then when I was in my own uh, healing process, I went to a different type of uh, group therapy for a number of years. And when I was done with that, um, and I would start to poke my head into uh, these celebrate recovery uh, groups, and not all churches have them uh, in my area. Um, uh, that's that's for sure. Um, but during like the rest of the week, I was like, "Well, is there any kind of any celebrate recovery stuff that I could listen to on a podcast?" And so I just uh, typed in celebrate recovery, and and your your ministry, your church was the the number one thing that came up. And so uh, I did go through a season where I would be faithfully uh, listen, listening along with those episodes, those, those um, larger group meetings that you guys did. And it was, and it was so encouraging because like for people uh, who don't know, celebrate recovery, like these are salt of the earth uh, people. (laughs) This is a salt of the earth ministry, I believe. Mm. And I guess I I just want to say three things before we get into more details about it, because I want you to explain it more um, for me. But as I was thinking about it, the thing I like about Celebrate Recovery is it really compels you to transparency, to be on, to be to, to have honesty and in church settings and in private relationships with your family or friends that's lacking. And that's mm-hmm. a huge genesis behind bumper sticker faith, because we want to get rid of those, that BS, those bumper mm-hmm. stickers. We want to be transparent and celebrate recovery. Like that's a must. You have to have that. Second Absolutely. thing is um, this idea of submission to a process. I think when life is falling apart, you don't know what to do. Well, well celebrate recovery offers this, this process, this literally step-by-step process that it it can lead you through and that you're called to submit to because your life got off track for whatever reason. And this is getting you back on some kind of a track, some kind of a 
a proven and tested uh, pathway. And so you have that to lean on. So transparency, uh, submission. And then the last thing that I thought of that really stands out to me is the relationships and the community that people can experience within a Celebrate Recovery group, unlike they probably have ever known in their life. I mean, I've been a part of small groups and uh, they only go so deep, <laughs> but Celebrate Recovery goes all the way to the bottom. That's right. That's right, man. It's uh, it's a huge ministry. It's a huge blessing. And for all those reasons, yeah. I mean, it's the, in my opinion, it's the number one discipleship tool in that I've come across in my years of doing ministry. Yep. It's really, really great. So tell us how, how did you get involved in Celebrate Recovery? Well, my name is Scott. I'm a grateful believer in Jesus Christ, and I'm in recovery for sex addiction. And mm-hmm. so I got involved. Um, really, my story is I started to look at non-porn as porn mm-hmm. uh, when I was nine years old. So for me, it was the bra ads in the newspaper that would come in, and that got me going in a direction that was not healthy. It elevated in junior high and high school once again. And uh, I was caught in just this turmoil. And I can get into more of my story a little bit later. But um, I just was struggling, struggling with this addiction that started to get a hold of me in high school, found multiple times going to like Christian camps, trying to confess. And for me, it was here's a Bible verse, go and sin no more. And I did not know how to deal with that. I didn't know what to do. I went to a Christian school, went to church. I thought if I just become more religious, more Christian, mm-hmm. then maybe that will solve my problem. And for me, it, it, that didn't work because it was in head knowledge, not heart knowledge. Mm-hmm. So I went off to a Christian college, Liberty University, mm-hmm. and played the Christian game more and just dove deeper into my addiction and um, thought maybe if I get married, that'll solve all my problems. <laughs> so I got married. That didn't solve my problems because no. my problem wasn't sex. My problem was... Uh, something inside me that I was trying to cope with through pornography. And that was a huge thing. And so then I uh, tried to hide it more and more and uh, ended up going into ministry. I was a youth pastor in Alaska wow. for about two and a half years. And my addiction ruined all my relationships up there. And so just because that's what addictions do mm-hmm. and uh, got caught up there. And I left and came back to my home church, Big Valley Grace Community Church. That's where my wife and I are from here in Modesto, California. And I had read tons of books because when I got found out, my wife bought me every sex addiction book out there that was in the Christian market. You know, Every Man's Battle, all that kind of stuff. Um, I've read all the books. I've prayed a lot. And there was a ministry just getting started called Celebrate Recovery. Mm. And it was like a last ditch effort of let me just get my wife off my back. I'll go to this ministry. Hmm. And so my wife and I showed up um, and that's how I got involved. That's what brought me in the doors was the fact that my life was 100% unmanageable. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what to do. And so I'd lost all hope. I was like, misusing scripture like saying well this is just my thorn in the flesh like paul Mm -hmm. would say but Mm -hmm. really it was a sin Mm -hmm. that was that i was entangled in Mm -hmm. and did not know how to deal with it so a few things about that i just want to highlight how the first thing about what you said was you um when you were youth especially uh you tried a lot harder and like we know that that's called white knuckling it and that doesn't Mm -hmm. work you mm-hmm. think that if you just try a lot harder, do more, that somehow it'll get better. But it, it's like you're you. It's like holding a, a thousand pound weight if you could do that. But after a while, you're gonna get tired, and eventually you will drop it. You you need to learn. You need to learn a different way uh, rather than just white knuckling it in the old way. That's I right. guess this, the second thing is that you you said this kind of sarcastically you thought to be a good christian a better christian 
oh, that's such a lie, right? Because, uh, and, I, and I want people maybe to pause and think about what, what you just said, what I just highlighted, because to be a Christian is not that. It's not to be able to hold the thousand pound rock at all times. That's not what being a Christian is. And I'm sure you learned that there's a different uh, way of being a Christian, um, being someone who's more vulnerable, that depends on grace, that lives in a different way, and, and so forth. But just wanted to uh, highlight a couple of those. So did CR, where did it start? Did it start at Big Valley? Do you know? No, it did not. So okay. Rick Warren at Saddleback Church. Oh, that's and right. Lake Forest started it um, with uh, an, a guy that was an alcoholic. John and- Baker. John Baker. Okay. Yeah. Like I have uh, this. Uh, there you go. You found it on the top. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I'm holding up a uh, little uh, a journal participants guide uh, uh, for Celebrate Recovery. Um, I have some of these. Yeah. Yeah. So those are step study guides. That's really where the rubber meets the road. But yeah, it started down at Lake Forest and I don't know what year it started, but yeah. it did start to grow. And it started to get out to other churches. And uh, my predecessor, Scott Miller, um, and a group of people went down there for a conference. And Scott Miller, I won't tell his whole story, but he's an addict. And so it really resonated with him as he found sobriety through uh, maybe some secular pro- a mm-hmm. secular program, uh, NA and AA. And so that resonated with him because it's the 12 steps with their biblical comparisons, Mm -hmm. bringing it back to the word of God and the 12 steps just teach you how to apply those scriptures to your life and walk Mm -hmm. you through a system, systematic recovery in how to find healing in your life. And so he loved it, brought it back. It started here at big Valley um, in 2003, I believe. 2003 and i started attending the the second week it was going and at the time our church was very blessed it started with 50 people and um it was big for me so my first time showing up man i was freaked out so what was that like what made and what made it different than any other christian kind of group you'd been a part of well because for me it was for my life and what I did is I played the Christian game Mm -hmm. and that meant when I'm in public and everything, this is what I present. Mm -hmm. And I don't let them see this other side of me. And so Mm -hmm. for me to go to that meeting was an attack on my pride. And I had to humble myself Mm because God gives grace to the humble. Mm -hmm. I showed up and I had to realize, Oh, um, I'm not perfect. I've got sin in my life mm-hmm. that's destroying it. And so I showed up late because I was like, if I show up late, then I can sneak in the back, sit down. Nobody will see me yeah. and I'll be safe. So I showed up late. I sit down and this dude turns around and goes, oh, hey, Scott, how are you? And I was like, right. <laughs> I know this guy. And uh, that was a bummer for me, but it was actually a really cool thing. Because got to hang out with that guy a little bit. His name was Greg. Um, we had done ministry previously together in junior high ministry and stuff. Mm. Um, and it was just really cool to be in there and know people. And it was cool. And so then we, that starts with a large group, which mm-hmm. I can talk about that a little bit later. But we broke up into our open share groups. And at the time, there was only like one group, and that was for addicts. So all the sex addicts, all the chemical addicts, all the drug addicts, every addict was in this room. Okay. And everyone starts going around sharing like I did. Hey, I'm so-and-so. I'm a grateful believer in Jesus Christ, and I struggle with this. And it was going around the room, and I was like, oh, this is real. Like, people are really being honest. Like, are we really doing this? Yeah, yeah, right. Um, Oh, (laughs) it's so exciting. And for me, it was the first time I was able to share that I was a sex addict yeah. in a Christian setting and not feel condemned, mm-hmm. or judged, or looked at like I had leprosy. Mm. I'm not just a pervert, you know? Mm-hmm. 
And so just that idea of that acceptance. And I think my first share, I talked for maybe a minute and a half. And I think I cried three fourths of the time. <laughs> and um, it was just such a healing time for me. Wow. That acceptance to go, hey, we know you sin. Mm-hmm. And we're glad you're here dealing with it. Yeah. And that was huge for me. So, I, I, I think that people don't have that in their life. I, I know that people that don't go to church probably don't have that, but people who even go to church don't have that. Yeah. E- even if they go to, you know, your typical small group or life group. Yeah. They don't have that. Typically, if they have friends even in the church, they don't have that. that <laughs> There's something true. very exciting and special about uh, that moment. Mm hmm. The authenticity wow. of it, the people mm-hmm. being real was huge. All the masks are de- are gone. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think we live in a world where we put up masks. Yeah. And um, to live behind that mask mm-hmm. is huge. And to take that mask off is yeah. is a very freeing moment. When yeah. You can do that. And that's that's what we talk about a bumper sticker faith that we have the we have these bumper stickers we hide behind the the things that. Um, I think you would want to hear the mm-hmm. things that I think God would want to hear the things that I think I should say. And we, we think that I think that so long as I have the right bumper stickers in place, then I'm okay. And then it even gets uh, even more uh, sinister than that sort of like what you're referencing before um, when we first started that, um, we have the sin in our life and we just maybe claim we go straight to like Romans 8 1. Oh, there mm-hmm. is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Oh, can get rid of that. I'm good. And we think that that's, uh, and if we feel, if we continue to feel bad about our sin, then we think, oh, well, uh, I need to lean more into that promise in the way that will help me to feel better. And it's like, no, that's you're, that's not it. That's still twisting it in my book. Like, if if you still have that that guilty feeling, then that feeling, I believe God keeps it in place until we confess in the right way. Yeah. Until we get real and say, "Hi, I'm Sam, and I and this this is what I struggle with." Until we um, come clean. Now. Once we come clean and, you know, we still feel that guilt and shame, that, that's another thing. And, but we can't just, and people in the church can't just go straight to these promises to help them to feel better. Cause sometimes God doesn't want us to feel better until we're, until we make him, put him back in his right place in our lives. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So, so the, the CR meetings that you, the ones that I went to just had a, a small group uh okay. part and that was it but yours has a big group time and a small group time yeah so that's called large group and open share group so um, we actually start with dinner so wow. at 5 30 we usually have a barbecue team that has cooked up either hamburgers hot dogs tri-tip chicken um, that's what we do out here in california mm-hmm. and we we serve it up and people eat they fellowship we call it the meeting before the meeting Mm -hmm. people can come and socialize build relationships at that time um that's a really cool time then we start at 6 30 in the main auditorium where we have worship time and um for me and i think the celebrate recovery program what's important during that time is that the worship is celebratory. It's called celebrate recovery. Wow. And so it's usually loud mm-hmm. and exciting music <laughs> and driven, um, upbeat, because otherwise people are like, if it's contemplative worship, they start thinking about all the troubles in their world. Yeah, yeah. Instead, we're able to take our eyes off of ourselves, put them on Christ and praise him for all the things that he's done and that he is doing and who that's, he is. That's really good. That's huge. So that's, that's kind really of good. Part of our large group time. Um, then we have uh, either a teaching or a testimony. So last night I taught on step two, which is hope. 
-hmm. And then next week, we're going to have somebody get up and share their testimony and basically their journey through life and then recovery and Mm -hmm. showing that uh, the 12 steps and the biblical comparisons, how God used those in their life to transform them Mm -hmm. and and what they're doing now with it. And it's just, it's a really cool time. So that's Mm -hmm. the first hour. The second hour is... Well, let me let me pause there and yeah. comment that your your teaching is fantastic. Like you you oh. personally uh, are a great you're a great teacher. Um, not all celebrate recovery groups will will have that obviously, but there's something about a, a guy who um, or a gal who has been broken by life and who has been humbled and is teaching from that place that um, really connects and resonates. Uh, and, and you don't feel like you have to, you know, put on a show. Uh, but that teaching is is powerful. Your teaching is powerful. And uh, also the testimonies. Like you said, the next week you usually have like someone giving their personal story for a half hour. And those are so encouraging mm. and uh, special too. And not, and, and people listening to this, not just the big valley testimonies, but anytime you can put yourself around people who are sharing their stories of brokenness and, and healing and recovery, you you hear those and you think, wow, it, it's not just me. Uh, mm. You feel very, very validated in your own struggles. And that's very important. And then you start to see other people wrestling with God and that's that's the part that I like. I get to see people genuinely struggling to 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 make God number one and to uh, work on themselves, and that that gives me that gives me courage to to go on. So those testimonies are are fantastic. Okay, so you have the big group. Yeah, let me just pause yeah. there. First of all, thank you for your encouraging words. That's awesome. Um, it's humbling. Yeah, um, I appreciate that. So. Definitely, you know, if somebody's listening, you want to find a recovery ministry that's teaching about and from a place of confession about their own life mm-hmm. and the struggles they've gone through rather than somebody, here's how you should do it. Mm-hmm. And um, and so I just encourage you with that um, if you're looking for a celibate recovery podcast or whatever mm-hmm. on that. And you do um, have like you have those ground rules within the small group meetings. I think maybe you're going to get into the small group time, Yes, but you have ground rules for sharing too. So I'll, I'll let you continue. Oh yeah, no, no, that's good. So then we have our open share group time. So we break up their gender specific and issue specific. And so women with women, men with men, um, and their, the issues, we are blessed with a larger ministry. So Mm -hmm. we have a lot of different groups. We've got, uh, chemical addiction, so that's alcohol, and then a different one for drugs. We've got sex addiction. We've got compulsive overeaters. We have uh, dysfunctional families. Mm. We have codependency. Um, we have codependent living with an addict. Um, so we have anger group, and wow. so those are some of the groups we have for both men and women. For the women, we have another group for those who have been involved with abuse. And so um, if they've been abused mentally, physically, or sexually, um, and I would even maybe throw in there biblically, um, Mm -hmm. that there's a group for them. And so they break up into their groups. They all have like groups. Some groups are smaller, four or five. Some of them are larger where there's like 30 in there. Um, But in those groups, we run those like the Subart Recovery model shows us through the DNA. And we've got our prayer time at the beginning. And then we really, the most important thing that can be shared in there are five group guidelines. And okay. this is what makes it safe for people to come in and share. If they don't feel safe, they're not going to open them up and share. And then you won't provide an environment for people mm-hmm. to begin that healing process. Mm-hmm. So the and first, these can and these can be applied to any small group, like absolutely. your your small group doesn't have to be a, a celebrate recovery group. So I want people to to start making these you know applications to their own uh, lives and groups too, because when these things are in place, yeah, it, more more powerful stuff I think can happen and more healing can happen. Absolutely, I even apply these guidelines when I'm starting to fight with my wife. Yes. Uh, I apply these guidelines to create just a boundary for us to work mm-hmm. with. And that helps us out. 
So the first group guideline is this, is that you keep your sharing focused on your own thoughts and feelings and you limit that sharing three to five minutes. Hmm. So we don't want to sit there and talk about our bosses and, well, this is what our spouse did. This is what our children did. We want it about them. And so this is how I, this situation happened. This is how I responded Mm -hmm. in it and how I chose to work through this or how it's affecting me. So we use IME statements Mm -hmm. um, a lot. And then the three to five minutes helps limit it. Mm -hmm. I've been in enough Christian small groups that there's that one person that takes 45 minutes of the hour talking. Yeah. And I just want, I just lose my mind. I'm like, what in the world? Stop. Yeah. Yeah. And um, this helps us do that. And being from the Christian world, that was probably the heart, one of the hardest things for me to do because I could BS my way through it. Mm -hmm. Right. But I actually had to only share three to five minutes. And then I had 55 minutes. I listened Mm -hmm. to other people. Mm-hmm. And I got to listen to their experience, their strength, and their hope. Mm-hmm. And that is where the healing begins. Mm-hmm. And it's the discipline for me of learning to just mm-hmm. shut my mouth and listen to other people. And yeah. I take what... what I want and I leave the rest. Look for the similarities, not the differences. Yeah. yeah when I was in a, in a group, um, they actually told me and another guy, I, <laughs> we weren't allowed to talk anymore <laughs> until, <laughs> until, actually with this other guy um so let me share his story yeah exactly (laughs) um but they said unless you can uh, unless you can make a personal application to your own life you're not allowed to talk which is good um Mm -hmm. but yeah it forces you uh to actually listen um the other thing i wanted to say about that was um what was the other thing i don't it'll probably come back to me but all right so the second guideline is that there's no crosstalk. Crosstalk is when two individuals engage in a conversation, excluding all others. Mm. So the way we put it in our groups is don't be rude. Mm-hmm. You know, be respectful of other people. Don't whisper, talk to the person next to you. If you do that, the person that's sharing may think that you're talking about them, you're giggling about them. Mm. It's not going to make it safe for them. So we put our phones away. We don't get on our phones. Um, we don't do any of that stuff. And uh, like help that helps it stay there. The yeah. third one is that um, we're not there to fix anybody. There's no fixing. So nobody is in there as an authority, even as the pastor of the ministry. When I go into group, I'm not there as the pastor. I'm mm. not there as the boss. There may be comments when I walk in. There's, oh, the big dog's here. Yeah, yeah. I'm just here. I'm a messed up guy, and I'm just in the group because I need group. Yeah. And, um we don't fix. And that's really hard. I really like that. There's a lot of people that will, when it becomes difficult is when somebody's sharing something that may be theologically incorrect or mm-hmm. out there mm-hmm. as Christians, we want to fix it. We want to mm-hmm. get in that debate. We want to deal with that. And the way that we phrase it here at big Valley is we just want the same Holy spirit that lives in me is the same Holy spirit that lives within them. And we're going to let the Holy spirit do his job. Mm-hmm. We're going to let him deal with it. Now, if something does need to be said, the facilitators can talk to that individual afterwards. Mm -hmm. And um, that's kind of how we deal with it at Big Valley. And so um, that's important for us. Because you probably, I mean, once you open up that can of allow, you know, allowing individual members to jump on theological doctrinal beliefs right then and there, then it's just going to start happening all the time. And then, and then it's so easy to get off your own issues. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. It hijacks the meeting. Yeah. And you're, you're projecting your problems maybe on someone else. Yep. Yeah. And, and for me, I'm also, I also struggle with compulsive overeating. And so for me, how that's played out in my life is when people try to fix me. So I'm a compulsive overeater. So their solution is trying to give me diets. Well, have you tried this diet? You obviously don't understand healthy food. So let me explain it to you. And all yeah. I want to do is punch him in the face. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not about that. I don't know how to eat. The fact is that I'm trying to cope with hurt and pain mm-hmm. by eating. I can binge eat a salad, mm-hmm. even with no dressing. Mm-hmm. I mean, I can binge eat that stuff yeah. Yeah. and be healthy, but I'm still trying to cope for something inside me that's going crazy. Yep. So it's just a different thing. So we try not to do the fixing. 
The fourth one is this, is anonymity and confidentiality is a basic requirement of the group. So what um, who we see here, what we share here stays here. And unless they're going to hurt themselves or somebody else, mm -hmm. then we need to report those things. So yeah, that's huge. You know, people need to know that when they go there, they're going to be safe. Yeah. Nobody's going to be ratting them out, all that kind of stuff. And I still remember I was a pastor in the ministry at the time, but I remember going to the gym. I got done with the gym and I'm in the locker room and I'm changing, getting ready for my day at work. And this guy He's talking about some a sobriety coin he got and uh, was showing it around to everybody. He was pretty proud of it and um, started talking to him about it. And he goes, oh, I remember you. I know who you are. And there's like 15 guys in this locker room. He goes, you're that sex addict. Oh, <laughs> no, clear in the locker room. They in the like, locker room. Oh, it's e echoing, yeah. <laughs> like, dude. So for me, that was fine. It didn't bother me, but. Give me that coin the, back. <laughs> yeah, being in a grocery store and your stuff being revealed. Hey, it was good seeing you at CR last night for your uh, alcoholism. Mm -hmm. That's just isn't cool. And so anonymity, confidentiality is huge. So we even have groups, group homes that come and join us. And that's the toughest one for them is to go back to their group home and these people they live with and not repeat what was shared in those mm -hmm. open channels. And so that's huge. Um, well, I do I know that uh, and not everyone goes to a big valley, you know, a church of that size. Mm -hmm. You know, most most churches are 100 people or so. Uh, and, and to be that vulnerable, you know, in, in a church, um, everybody knows you and your stuff. And 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 I've heard I've heard, heard a number of people over the years saying, well, they don't want to be a part of a small group because then everyone in the church will know their stuff. That mm -hmm. saddens me, saddens yeah. me. That's why if there's not a lot of guidelines that when they're broken, that I will come down on somebody and be really hard on them. They speak six, seven minutes, whatever. I can mm -hmm. talk and work with them on it. But if they break the fourth guideline and they blow somebody's anonymity or confidentiality, mm -hmm. I deal with that swiftly mm -hmm. and quickly. And it's the only thing that I've asked somebody mm -hmm. to step away from the ministry for is because they make um. it up. Everything. Wow, that's great. Um, I remember what I thought of before, and yeah. th these guidelines, having these types of guidelines in place helps with uh, what I'm going to say, and that is another part of Christian groups, church churchy groups, is that we think we have to be so nice all the time. And nice is the enemy of recovery. Mm. It's the <laughs> enemy of all kind of of true relationships, uh, just being this fake kind of a nice because we think that's what we should be. And when someone is going on and on and on for you know 10, 15 minutes, or when someone breaks confidentiality or goes against some of these other group rules, we can't be, you know, quote unquote nice about it. Yeah. And 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 we're so afraid to, to say no. Um, stop talking or stop uh, gossiping or sharing um, because we think, no, we have to be nice and you know, Christ-like, uh, which is completely wrong. And one thing that these guidelines kind of helps you uh, with that because you can just appeal to the um, to the guidelines if you, if you don't have a backbone <laughs> quite yet, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. So we have hand motions in our group to... Um to deal with some of them. Sometimes they have signs they hold up, wrap up your thoughts. Oh, wow. Mine is like, we always tap the, you know, hey, the wrist or cross talk. We tap a table or whatever. And huh. we just have different, you know, hand signals or whatever. And we go through that. But <laughs> so those hand signals work at home too. <laughs> oh man. I hope <laughs> probably not. She'd give you hey, a different hey, signal. You're talking too long. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think I'd get in trouble with that one. with yeah. my wife. Yeah. Uh, so, um, and then our fifth guideline is this, that uh, it's a Christ-centered recovery group, so no mm -hmm. foul language. And when you are sharing, don't be descriptive about your use. Don't okay. describe and get too graphic about those things because um, that, that can damage more people in the room. And yeah. so 
I mean, that's huge. I mean, that goes back to scripture about what we come, what comes out of our mouth really should be edifying to Mm -hmm. building people up rather than tearing them down Mm -hmm. and start slipping into the foul language and stuff like that. It just doesn't, doesn't do good. Yeah. And isn't, and keeps us stuck where we're at and not heal. And we need that healing process. So we have those five guidelines. That's what makes it safe for the groups. And so after we go over the guidelines, uh, for oh, so, open- so you go over those each session, each night. every session. Wow, every that's great. Session you go over it. So hopefully the guys, if they've been coming a while, or gals, that they will, they'll know those by heart and mm-hmm. they'll know them. So we go over them every single week mm-hmm. um, before any group starts. Mm-hmm. We do that. Um, and then after we go over those guidelines, we give them a focus question. And that's kind of to guide our night. So here's for the next 45 minutes or whatever. We're going to be, this is our question. So we're going to answer it. And so like last night, our lesson was on hope. So the question was, uh, I think there was two questions with it. It was, what do you believe about God? And um, what in your life are you ready to change? And those are the two questions. And then we ask that usually the facilitator shares and then they go around the group and they answer that question um, according to that. And they're three to five minutes. And, uh, and then at the end we close with the serenity prayer or the Lord's prayer. um, Mm -hmm. And that, that hour is done. So Mm. there's a lot that happens, but it's a great evening. Wow. Yeah. I'd love to, we don't have time, but dig more into that. Um, in the time that we do have left though, um, do you do all, do you, do you model yours on the 12 steps or the, the eight steps that the, um, um, eight biblical principles. Yeah. So we, we go by the 12 steps. Yeah. Um, that's how it was written originally. And I know the last, couple years there's been a shift back to the eight biblical the eight principles um but i think the eight principles encompass the 12 steps Mm -hmm. so but for us really we we go by the 12 steps yeah there's some of that's purposeful Mm -hmm. we have a lot of people that go to secular recovery as well Mm -hmm. um just a great place to go and share and Mm -hmm. bring light into a dark world Mm -hmm. Um, bring a, a higher power of Jesus Christ into a secular area. And so it allows there to be openness and commonality between us and maybe AA mm-hmm. or NA, or we have quite a few people that go to SA, mm-hmm. which is Sex Addiction Anonymous. And, um, and so it just allows that to be a better crossover and for us to reach the secular world better. Yeah, well, originally, whenever these were written, they were written by a minister, and he consulted Carl Jung uh, mm-hmm. when they wrote the 12 Steps. So they, I mean, they're rich. <laughs> they're very rich, and they're good. And I want, so I want to maybe start with just a couple. We won't get through all of them, but if yeah. you could, um, if we could talk about a couple of these steps, where the process begins, and then uh, before we do that, though, um, just um again want to encourage people that these celebrate recovery groups are everywhere and chances are there's a church around you that has one and so this all this that we're talking about is is available types of it are available to people right now so the 12 steps where do they begin oh man um that is a great question it starts with step one which is stepping out of denial yeah and um, do you want me to read those? Well, I have it open here. Awesome. Uh, we, yeah, we admitted that we were powerless over our addictions and compulsive behaviors and that our lives had become unmanageable. And then the scripture that this um, journal provides is from Romans seven eighteen, which right. says, I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature, for I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. Absolutely. So the first thing is humbling ourselves. Uh, mm-hmm. This is this is why I truly believe this is the number one discipleship tool is really these steps. Mm-hmm. Um, because yes. it takes you to a place that you realize, hey, I'm a sinner. 
I'm not in control of my life as much as I try to control everything around me. I can't control anything. And it's humbling yourself before God, before others, and looking at this, admitting that you're powerless over it and taking you back to realize that there is a separation between you and God. Mm. And um, which is really where step two comes in, which is we came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Mm. And uh, that's Philippians 2.13 that kind of goes with that. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. And just that idea of realizing I'm not God. Sometimes I find that in the Christian world, people like to play the Holy Spirit. Mm. They like to play God for other people. They like to play God for their kids. They like Mm. to play God for their husband or their wife. They like to do that and they don't realize that they're not God Mm. um, and that their life is insane. And they which is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. Yeah. And they, that, that's such a vivid picture to bring us back to sanity. It's like, wait a minute. Especially when we were talking about that, like white knuckling, trying to be perfect. Yeah. We think that that's trying to be Christian sane, but, exactly. it, but it's not. You, you're, you're insane at that moment when you think that you can pull off a perfect life. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And, so. and especially that you could fix other people, like you said. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, the idea of, well, I'm going to marry this person with the idea of, I think I can fix them. I can, I can make them better. I can make them better. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So wow. that moves into step three, which is we made a direction or we made a decision to turn our lives and our will over the care of God. Hmm. And then that is Romans 12, 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Mm -hmm. Um, In the church, it's common for people to understand uh, salvation, and they're going to surrender their life to God. And that's great, and that's Mm -hmm. done. Recovery brings it down to either another step of surrendering our will over to him every single day sometimes moment by moment, of that it's not my will, it's your will. We see that with Jesus as he prays in the Garden of Gethsemane, Mm -hmm. that that's going to happen. And so that's really the surrender of all control of our life over to him. Mm. And that's really, really difficult. I think of um, John 5 with uh, the guy at the Pool of Bethesda, Mm -hmm. and he's lying there for decades, and Jesus' question to him, which is such a searching question for every listener to ask themselves. And that is, do you want to be well? Jesus asked him, do you want to be healed? Do you want to be well? And that's that. Yeah, that's that will that you're talking about. It's not just this kind of superficial. Yeah. I'm surrendering my life over to Jesus, you know, one day for salvation, but this, this is getting at, What's keeping you from getting up? Like, is there some kind of, uh, is it some kind of a coping mechanism? Maybe from your your childhood where you got attention or you could manipulate the adults in your life by pretending or by being a a victim or even, even a hero, you know, and you're stuck in this unwell, this unhealthy process that as an adult, you think, well, that's that kind of manipulation going to keep working but it's like no now you now you're an adult and uh you have adult sized problems and that childish uh, way won't continue to work and so jesus is like he just gets right at it do you want to be well or do you want to keep doing the same unhealthy unwell stuff that's leaving you down yeah yeah i'm gonna work with somebody I ask him three questions one do you have a problem hmm. yeah you know, do you want do you want to get well? Yeah. Mm. And then the follow up to that is, are you willing to do whatever it takes? Mm. And that's a tough question, because then they're like, oh, that, that means actually doing whatever it takes to get well. Mm-hmm. A lot of times people go half measures, mm-hmm. but uh, half measures don't avail us much. So well, those those all aren't all easy questions either, because I've been around people who would say no to the first one. <laughs> do you have a problem? They're like, no, no, it's not my problem. It's 
my wife's problem, or it's these these friends, or, or I was caught, I was trapped, you know, or it's a system. People don't want to admit that they have a problem. And- like that country song that, hey, people say I got a drinking problem. I got no problem drinking at all. <laughs> <laughs> that is reality, man. Yeah. Um, that, so the first three steps take yeah. us to the fact that we're sinners. There is a God out there, and we're not him. Mm. And we surrender our life to him. Mm-hmm. And once that happens, that sounds like salvation to me. That sounds like evangelism. That sounds very much the important part of what churches like to do mm-hmm. step four takes us to this point of that we make a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves this is something that we don't do in the church mm. i'm sorry we don't do this we, we don't, don't comprehend it what no. i hear is people going well i've already asked god for forgiveness so do i really have to write that down mm. do i really have to go back through that yeah yeah, yeah you do we do so Lamentations 340, wow. let us examine our ways and test them and let us return to the Lord. Mm. Just something powerful when we sit down and we write out all the ways that we have hurt other people mm-hmm. and all the ways that maybe we've been hurt. Mm-hmm. There's something powerful about that. One, it is a character check. Tra- there is a character check there. We don't like to realize how bad of a person we are sometimes Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. we've actually done but when we're able to see that list man it gives us a better understanding of the grace we've received Mm -hmm. and allows us to have grace for other people Mm -hmm. and i'd be like and look at other people in their sin and judge them yeah 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 because you have this like and we're saying like quite literally write it out start from like if you have a uh, porn addiction start from from the first time I mean, no maybe it wasn't your fault that you saw it maybe someone sh- showed it to you but start from that age 10 or whatever it was write it down write it down and and you may have a document that's 20 pages long you know but that's that searching and fearless i love those two words a searching yeah. and fearless inventory because you have to you have to be pretty courageous to to search that out and and then to face it. But then another beautiful part of it, along with you'll be less judgmental to others, for instance. Yeah. Uh, but along with that, when you have that all written down, you're going to start to be able to see patterns in your own life, right? Yep. Because you see that, oh, well, the, my use really like escalated during this time in my life. And maybe your parents are really struggling with going through a divorce, or maybe there's a death in the family, or or maybe there's loneliness, friends moved away, or, or a sickness. You'll be able to see patterns, and it, it'll be it'll be eye-opening uh, when you have that all written down in front of you. <clears throat> Absolutely. Um, it's, I mean, it's huge. The great thing about the workbooks that you have, the participant guides, it's mm-hmm. going to take you through how to do that. Okay. Great. And you don't want to do this alone. As you yeah. go through this, you always you want to have a sponsor. You know, you talked about the power of groups earlier. Mm-hmm. There is a power of this community that really helps you. And you want somebody to really come alongside you. Do the one and others of scripture. Somebody that's already done that work to help you through it. And so Okay, so talk about that sponsor. Every Everybody has a sponsor? Well, they should. So okay. when they start recovering, mean, it's not like you walk in the group and they assign you a sponsor. Okay. But um, as you start going through the recovery process, you are sitting in these groups, these open share groups, and you're listening to people's experience, strength, and hope. And the idea is that you want to find a sponsor, somebody that has more recovery than you, that's walked this road before, and that can help you along this mm-hmm. journey. So you listen we're blessed with the larger ministry. And so we have more options. Mm-hmm. You listen to people and you, if you hear somebody and you want what they got, those are the people you start to go talk to, to, to get help. You start, you get dessert afterwards with them. You get them dinner the next week mm-hmm. and you start to get to know them. You take them out for coffee throughout the week and you get to know them with the idea of, Hey, I'm going to ask this person maybe to sponsor me. And, uh, what they'll do is they'll meet with you on a regular basis and start taking you through the participant guide along with the step study that you're involved okay. in and work you through the, the 12 steps. So 
that's kind Lo- of how- I love the fact that you have so many uh meal op- meal opportunities together because that <laughs> that that begins to break down the process and helps to uh, warm people to each other. It does, man. There's something powerful about that. Yeah. Yeah. That, uh, you know, Jesus ate with his disciples. Why can't we eat with each other? Right. Yeah. So then that goes to number five. We admitted yep. to God, ourselves, and another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. And the verses, James 5 16, therefore confess your sins to each other and pray uh, for each other so that you may be healed. So it kind of sounds like you're taking that. Uh, st- stuff that you did in number four, that searching and fearless moral inventory, and you bring it to another person. Absolutely. Wow. There's, you know, we talk about not giving Satan a foothold in our mm-hmm. life, we talk about all this stuff, and there's really power in secrets, and you're only as sick yep. as your secret. Yep. And so when we're able to share with one God, then ourselves admit that, hey, this is stuff we actually did. And then there's at least one other person in the world that knows everything about me and everything mm-hmm. I've done. It's so freeing. Mm-hmm. It is so freeing and so helpful. Um, and it's healing. You mm-hmm. know, that's what James 5, 16 says. Is yes, it's, it's healing. And uh, that's that's a huge part of it. And mm-hmm. uh, so a lot of people get scared. Now, mm-hmm. it doesn't say who you have to tell. Some people, mm-hmm. most people tell their sponsor. I've had guys go tell a drunk guy in the park. I've had guys go tell a priest. I've had guys go talk to people that they'll never see again. Mm-hmm. The important thing is that you go and tell somebody. That's great. So that's that's great. Important. Yeah. I, I was always told that uh, if you can't talk about something, then it holds power over you. Yep. Even, Absolutely. even in your relationships with your spouse or your kids, if there's an issue that you can't talk about, it, it just grows and grows. Um, and then that's, that's why, as you pointed out, the opposite of that will bring healing. Yep. Wow. Yep. So, so number six. Yep. We um, were entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. Mm-hmm. And, and James 4.10, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. Mm-hmm. So step six is about what you saw as seeing those patterns. So mm-hmm. in the stuff that you've done and the hurt you've had, you're going to see patterns in there and you're going to see some character defects. Um, guess what? I'm a liar. Mm-hmm. Man, there's a lot of stuff on this yeah. list. Of lying. Oh man, I'm pretty lustful because look at all these things that are going on. Mm-hmm. You can start to see those character defects and mm-hmm. all that kind of stuff. Oh man, I'm not a man of my word. Mm-hmm. Oh, I need to write that down. So mm-hmm. you start to deal with that kind of stuff and it's it's mm-hmm. huge. Sneaking, that's another big one. Mm. Sneaking. Yeah, evasive, yeah. I mean that's one of mine is I'm extremely evasive. It's like nailing yeah. yellow to a tree. I can't do it. <laughs> just, I'm like <laughs> so I mean it took me a while to get on this podcast with you. So uh <laughs> now here th- th- I don't know why I just thought of this. But you you wrestle, right? You grew up wrestling? I did not. I just you, am a coach. Oh, you're a coach. I'm a coach. I don't wrestle. I wish I wrestled, but, but no. You, but you coach. never did. Wow. I got bamboozled into it, and yeah. I enjoy it. And so I bring people that actually know what they're doing into it, and I just kind of oversee it and manage it. And But you've been pretty successful as a coach, right? Yeah, my, my team has done very well. Wow. So uh, they've done really, really well. I thought of that because I I grew up wrestling, wrestled from when I was a kid up, up through college. And um I remember this this guy, this is not a smiling moment, but I smiled just because it's my coping mechanism. But I was a pastor and um I'm not anymore. But this angry, angry guy in my church, uh, he was just frustrated about um the way I would the way I was behaving and things I was saying at this meeting I was having. And he finally blurted out, he's like, you wrestlers are all the same. You're always trying to get out of it. And I was oh, like, man. Uh, and it, my first response was, this guy's an idiot. You know, yeah. how can you? But that, you know, 20 years later or whatever, it still haunts me. And I still, okay, is that a pattern? Maybe it's not true with wrestlers, but it is a good kind of analogy. Am I always trying to sneak or get out of things, be evasive? You didn't you go know? blast double or anything? <laughs> <laughs> I, I wanted to big time, 
but, of but course. then I wouldn't be a pastor for another reason. <laughs> exactly, right? <laughs> uh, so, so step seven, yeah. the one we're on, is we humbly ask him to remove all our shortcomings. First hmm. um, John 1, 9, one of my favorite passages of scripture. Hmm. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So we see those character defects. And now we're going to pray and ask God to remove them. We're going to ask him to take those things away, you know, and I, I love the fact that says we humbly, mm -hmm. humbly come to him. And that's huge. So, you know, and, we've the fact that we've got sin in our life and we're asking God to remove them and there's patterns and we're asking God to continue to remove these things. Yeah. And then number eight says, oh, this is where the rubber really meets the road as well. Each <laughs> of these are, are, they flow well to each other, but they're completely different. And they are completely like exactly what every person needs to be sane and healthy. But number eight says, we made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. And the scriptures, Luke 631, do to others as you would have them do to you. Yeah. So, so what does that look like? Ooh, that's huge. Well, yeah. I... I believe part of the amends process is forgiving within our own heart first. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it's dealing with the resentments we have. Resentment is our number one offender. And so we've got to deal with that. And we have to forgive those who have hurt us. Mm -hmm. So we go back to that inventory list. Mm -hmm. We see that all those people that have hurt us, mm -hmm. we work on forgiving them. Scripture tells yeah. us and commands us that we need to forgive. Mm -hmm. Really, I don't see a process in scripture where it shows us how to forgive. Yeah. Just forgive them. Well, what in the world does that mean? Mm. You know, it's that re it's removing that emotion from the memory. You know, when you see that person that you're angry at or that did something to you, you see them in the grocery store that it doesn't mm -hmm. put a quickening in your spirit. It's mm -hmm. uh, there's this grace there, there's this forgiveness there. Um, I like that too because. Our sin, because you went to the place where you start with that inventory that, that you know we could call it that sin that sin list right and in a way uh our sins i've said this before on the podcast but your sins are symptoms i mean there are a whole bunch of other things but one thing that they are are their symptoms too and they're showing you that hey something's not right here follow up with it so like if you're caught in that in in that sin that behavior in in a sense, what you just said was you, you tied it to a hurt, probably that someone did to you, and wh where you need to you know go and forgive them. Then, uh, but chances are those those sin hot spots are uh, kind of revolving around some pain, maybe some wound from somebody else. That and, and that in a sense, that's a blessing if you can uh, find that, and then the forgiveness as well. I don't. Does that make sense? Absolutely. It makes sense. Yeah. It's that, you know, I think it says being willing to make amends yeah. um, is step eight and that's huge. And so that willingness comes from really forgiving them. And now mm -hmm. I'm willing to have at least a conversation with them. Yeah. Uh, and it's, I think that's, that is the key to this finding true freedom from everything. It continues that. to break the power when you talk to those people. And that and goes it, to number nine, right? It does. But I want to talk real quick a little yeah. bit more about forgiveness is the fact that it's not as easy as just, okay, I forgive you. Mm. I mean, we tell the person that, that was abused at five years old by their uncle or by their aunt or whoever, yeah. uh, you know, just forgive them. Well, what in the world does that look What does like? that even mean? Yeah. Yeah. And so it takes time. And so I'd really talk to people about praying blessings into that person's life for a period of time, mm -hmm. not pray that the they get hit by a truck or anything mm -hmm. like that, but pray that there's blessings that God pours their favor out upon them and blesses them and helps them uh, as they and prosper and do well and mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. And that starts to do work in our heart and starts to transform our heart uh, mm -hmm. to give them a little bit more grace and understanding. And there's, it removes that bad emotion mm -hmm with a little bit better emotion. If that doesn't work, we really start to write out letters and we write those letters out and go through a process of a forgiveness letter. Now we don't go and give it to them. We just write it out um, and start working through that. And 
Mm-hmm. Most of the time that works, there may be one or two things that it's an ongoing thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's just constantly going back to some of those same things to and, until you can find a true forgiveness that that you can find there. And that is so powerful and helpful, those steps. Like if you can't outright forgive them or don't even know what that looks like quite yet, start with these practical steps of praying blessings in their lives, of writing it out. Uh, something that maybe only you will read. I think those are super helpful and practical, very wise. I mean, scripture it, tells us to pray for our enemies, right? Yeah. So, what, what about forgiving yourself? Um, I, you know, I've brought that up in the past with uh, pastors, church leaders, and they always kind of roll their eyes and say, "Oh, well, you know." You don't need to forgive yourself, you know. You, you don't really trust in God because you know God alone can forgive. And but then when my life was wrecked and broken, uh, and I've had counselors, therapists say to me, "Sam, you need to start by forgiving yourself." Yeah. Like I realized the power and the truth of that. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure in, in your groups too. What about oh, forgiving yourself? Yeah, that's a huge one that a lot of people deal with. Uh, sometimes I'm not all not always nice in how I approach this. Mm-hmm. So I will say, okay, so tell me about this. There's this God of the universe who created everything, who's perfect, holy, sent his son to die on the cross, and he has forgiven you of everything on this list, yet you can't forgive yourself? <laughs> are you greater than God? Like, yeah. are you, like... What what is this? And yeah. so sometimes I I address that like that, but it it is maybe even praying blessings for your own life, mm. praying for you to find grace for yourself, empathy for yourself. Wow! Um, wow! Those kinds of things are huge. So taking those same steps for others and applying them to yourself. Absolutely. I would love it if people would do that. Matter of fact, I might start doing that. That's very good. Well, I mean, we like to beat ourselves up. Yeah. And yeah. we have this perception of what we should be and who we should be. Yeah. And we have to break that paradigm and realize yeah. accept life on life's terms. And we have to accept yeah. who we are. Yeah. Like God doesn't want us to stay there. He wants yeah. us to get better and become more like him. But in order to do that, we have to go through that process yeah. of acceptance. Yeah. Empathy for yourself. And just on a societal level right now, there's not a lot of empathy for ourselves and, and the way that God has made us. And we look via social media and we, we see how great everyone else is. And then we just load on the self-pity and the, uh, and it, and the lack of acceptance for ourselves. And we need to, probably we need to start there. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So that goes to number nine. Which um, is the tough part. This is the this is tough for a lot of people. Okay. So, but go ahead. Yeah, we made a direct amends. We made direct amends to such people whenever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. Mm. And, and the scripture five scripture is huge. Yeah. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you. Leave your gift there in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Yeah. Wow. This this is huge. So this is where we actually go back Mm -hmm. to people that we have hurt. Mm -hmm. This is where a lot of people mess up. So they'll go back to someone and go, hey, I just want you to know, Sam, I forgave you. You're forgiven. <laughs> oh, right. That's not what we're talking about in forgiveness. Forgive- I think there was a Seinfeld episode that where where they did that. <laughs> they probably did. We don't do that. We forgive them internally, and that forgiveness allows us to take this step and then go back and say, "Hey, I'm sorry. I did this, and I see how that was hurtful and painful for mm-hmm. you." It's not this big long list. I remember I wrote out this big a men's letter to somebody Mm -hmm. and I gave it to my sponsor and he goes, this is cred. What are you doing? Like, Mm -hmm. just keep it simple. Keep it simple. It's the kiss principle. Keep it simple, stupid. Mm -hmm. Just write out, Hey, this is what I did. I see how it hurt you in this way. And you're done. Mm -hmm. And 
I, we don't ask for forgiveness growing up. I was always said, well, you have, you know, go ask for forgiveness, you know, and um, I don't like that. Mm -hmm. I think, I mean, I've got my own and maybe that's a whole nother podcast, but um, <laughs> just the idea of that really puts the other person on spot and they may not be ready in their mm -hmm. own journey mm -hmm. to give you that forgiveness. Now, yeah. small things, that's one thing. But when you're talking about affairs, you're talking about deep wounds mm -hmm. and you go, Hey, I'm sorry for this. Will you forgive me? God may not be done with the work he's doing in their life and it needs to be on their time. And so yeah. we encourage our people to simply go and make amends and tell the other person that they're sorry yeah. for the behavior that they did. Yeah. And you may be kind of skirting, taking responsibility and doing something about the harm that you did. Because if you feel like if they, they can say, okay, I forgive you. Then you think, okay, my work's done. You know, no it minimizes mistakes. what we did. Yeah, yeah. And minimize what you did. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So number 10, we continued to take personal inventory and when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. First Corinthians 10, 12 says, so if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. So you can continue. Yeah. So this is basically working steps one through nine on a daily basis. Okay. So it's it's really practical. It's it's teaching us how to become like Christ daily. Yeah. And then number 11, um, we sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God, praying only for knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. Colossians 3.16 says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. And I'll just round it out. Number 12. Having had a spiritual experience as a result of these steps, we try to carry this message to others and to practice these principles in all our affairs. And then Galatians 6.1 says, Brothers, if someone is caught in sin, you who are spiritual should restore him gently, but watch yourself, or you also may be tempted. Yeah. Well, step 11 is teaching us how to build our relationship with Christ on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. What we do in step 12 is giving back. It's helping others. Yeah. And Sounds like evangelism too. Exactly. When you so when I look at the 12 steps, I go, man, this is the best discipleship tool. If everybody in, yeah. in our church did these 12 steps, yeah, man, it would be amazing. Yeah. And so that's what I do. I teach teach my wrestlers these things when I go wow, through really? the season. Um, you know, I'm blessed to coach at a Christian school. Yeah. And so I'm able to go in there and I do a devotional once a week huh. and I take them through these 12 steps throughout the year. You know, wow. how much they stand them, you know, they just got done wrestling for two hours and then they're going to try and catch air and think about this is tough. But um, that is such a, I love, that's such a beautiful picture to me because I can put myself there. I know what wrestling is like. And then to have older guys in my life pouring in this kind of discipleship model and truth model i mean i am so excited about the future of those uh young men yeah definitely so because unfortunately they're dealing i the reason why i started doing that is really because when i was in high school mm -hmm. i wish there was a safe place for me to go talk i wish people yeah. were talking to me like that yeah so now when i coach yeah. whether it be football or wrestling i really try to be a place that is speaking those type of things yeah. and trying to their life and it's the exact opposite of ego. I mean, the whole 12 steps is the exact opposite of what culture has us to do and and, the, and how it posture, would posture us. It's it, it's complete opposite. It's embracing, accepting yourself. It's, um, it's trusting in God, knowing you're limited. And yeah, it's the exact opposite. What a gift to give them. Yeah. All right. Yeah. We're going we're gonna to wrap it up, but... Uh, um, it was such a joy uh, talking with you. Um, I think this is really going to be helpful. It's been helpful for me. I know it's going to be helpful for other people too. Any other um, thoughts that you have or wanted to mention? I just appreciate the opportunity. And uh, the only thing is, man, if you are struggling in a sin or somebody is hurting, um, to look for a group that they can get involved with. And maybe it's as simple as looking and listening to you know, our podcast or your podcast getting connected, but really locally, 
And so if you're looking for a Celebrate Recovery group, to go on to Celebrate Recovery Group Finder, and mm-hmm. it'll show you where the Celebrate Recoveries are in your area and right. get connected. And I do believe there may be even some now online that they have Zoom meetings and stuff like that that they okay. can in as well. Yeah. And so what we talked about today was the large group, which is the teaching through things. But mm-hmm. there's actually a deeper step, which you have in your possession is those four participant guides. Okay. They're not meant to go through it alone, but getting a group of, uh, of if you're a guy with guys, with ladies, with ladies, and going through that together and working through that. Now it's about a year commitment, but it is worth it. I mean, do you want to get well? Mm. <laughs> so love it. Uh, <laughs> love just it. Not there. So yep. thank you for letting me be on this and share. And uh, it was a, it was an honor. Yeah, maybe we could uh, break down a more specific topic in the future for another episode. (laughs) Definitely, definitely. Yeah, good. Well, thanks everyone for joining us for episode 90 of Bumper Sticker Faith. Thanks for making it to the end. I hope that this was helpful. I know it. I know it was. It's got to be. It's got to be. And uh, keep in mind, uh, like we talked about, you can apply these to your own life, to your own marriage. Uh, to your kids, uh, to your church groups, to your workplace. I mean, th- this is just a pathway to health and to wholeness. So you can learn more about us at bumperstickerfaith.com. Shoot us an email, bumperstickerfaith at gmail.com. Uh, learn how to support us. If you like this, as become a BS Crew member. Go to the <laughs> website, click the menu tab that says BS Crew, and you can learn how, how to support us for a little bit each month. I think it's like five bucks or something. So uh, thanks, everybody, for joining us. And uh, I don't have a partner here, so no one else to finish this statement. <laughs> but remember, everyone, don't go stepping in and no BS. Right, thank you. <laughs>